On the day of my first move into a new home, I was packing up my car when I received a frantic phone call. It turns out a boy named Jake was having a different moving experience. I had come to know Jake as the volunteer advocate assigned to him when he entered foster care. I could hear Jake crying in the background as his foster parents explained he's being removed from their home and was refusing to leave. For me, this day marked the first time in my life that I would pack up and move. For Jake, it was his fifth move, and he was only seven. It's typical for a child in foster care to be moved around frequently, sometimes upwards of 10 times. And while moving between shelters and foster homes, their belongings are often packed into trash bags. The advertising industry, which was my day job, saw this as a messaging opportunity. Portray children, crying, traumatized, carrying trash bags. Advertising relies on provocative imagery like this to trigger an emotional reaction. Campaigns like this are known to generate high levels of views, clicks, and shares, and in this case, secure an overwhelming amount of suitcase donations. You would think campaigns like this are successful, wouldn't you? What I know from working with great nonprofits is that when we measure success based on typical marketing metrics like click rates and shares, there are a few things that we miss. We miss the opportunity to assess the long-term effects of our actions. We forget to ask, did we make the right impact? And we miss how we might unintentionally cause harm. As someone who's been involved with the foster care system for nearly a decade, I witness how campaigns like this oversimplify the public's understanding of the needs and identities of children in foster care. You might be thinking, the campaign did inspire people to donate suitcases. Surely that is better than a trash bag. Follow me for a moment to Jake's foster home that day. When I arrived, I could hear him crying from the driveway. I'm greeted at the door by his foster parents, a friendly elderly couple visibly at a loss for what to do. Following the sound of Jake's voice, I make my way towards the stairs, and there they were, the famed trash bags. Everything Jake has ever owned filled two of them. I'm just staring at these bags, thinking, wow, the ads really are true. Suddenly, my gaze is interrupted by Jake, who grabs one of the bags, drags it down the hall, and tosses it back into the empty room that, for almost a full year, was starting to feel like home. Not even a full year, and this was Jake's longest stay since entering the system. He was only four when he was removed from his parents' care and separated from his siblings. The experience was traumatizing then, and it has remained traumatizing ever since. I often think about Jake's mother, if she just had the resources to provide adequate care for her children or to leave an abusive situation, I wonder what could be possible. But despite the possibilities, we are left with a heartbroken and terrified child experiencing yet another major disruption. Jake looks at me, and he tells me he feels hopeless. Repeating the plea he's now been making for hours, he says, this isn't right. Please, I don't want to go someplace new again. There's no way I could imagine merely handing this child a suitcase. A suitcase is a better way to travel, but that's not the problem we need to be solving. A child spends less time in the system when they have at least one consistent person who knows them, understands what they've been through, and advocates for them. Changing antiquated policies and practices can reduce the number of times a child is moved. Investing in resources and early intervention for families in crisis can prevent entry into the system in the first place. 
But as a result of imagery portraying children with trash bags, the public's understanding of what a child like Jake needs is a suitcase. When children in foster care themselves see this imagery, they are left to wonder, this is how the world understands me? All humans, especially children, deserve to see themselves portrayed with dignity and to feel like their needs and experiences are truly understood. But when playing on human emotion is fundamental to spreading content about complex societal issues, people react to a single symptom of a deep-rooted, unchecked, and broken system. Do you know that people who have spent time in foster care experience PTSD at twice the rate of US war veterans? It's not just the incidents that land children in the system that create trauma. Physical abuse accounts for less than 16% of cases nationally. Neglect and other circumstances make up an overwhelming 84% of cases. It's not horrific abuse or a lack of love that's tearing most families apart and perpetuating their trauma. It's the effects of poverty and other broken systems, food insecurity, inadequate housing, and unaddressed physical and mental health, notably drug addiction. Rather than supporting efforts to help families access treatment, escape poverty, and overcome crisis, we typically deal with these broken systems with the same surface-level approach. Humans experiencing homelessness receive more of our unwanted items than advocates fighting for a better system where all humans are nourished and housed. The need for shoe drives year after year should challenge us to investigate what's pushing more and more families into poverty. School supplies are donated to students within a school system that isn't preparing them with the skills and knowledge to thrive. Desmond Tutu put it this way, we need to stop just pulling people out of the river. We need to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. To campaign for human dignity and repair broken systems is to push for public resources and services that will prevent people from falling into rivers. That's not as easy as donating material goods. But where things feel complicated or emotionally difficult to act upon is where humanity's collective understanding and mindful action is needed the most. There's value in efforts to reduce waste and ensure people have the material possessions needed to get by. But when material needs are met without structural solutions, we not only leave a broken system unchecked, we also reinforce a superiority complex, gracefully perceiving ourselves as the hero, the fixer, the leader, the good one, the smart one, the moral one. What does that do for a perception of people who need help? Research shows that the public perceives people struggling with drug addictions as weak and moral failures. But the common factors contributing to addiction are not personal flaws. They're often societal factors too. Poverty, educational disparities, and access to healthcare play a role here too. Reducing a human's experience down to a judgment of their moral capacity creates the conditions for broken systems to remain broken. The public's negative attitudes towards people with the treatable condition of drug addiction has a negative effect on insurance in ho housing and employment policies that are conducive to recovery. So where do the neg negative perceptions come from? Let's revisit my old day job. The average American consumer is now exposed to over 4,000 advertising and media messages per day. That's up from 500 per day in the 70s. And it's no secret that the messaging we persistently encounter quietly influences the way we think, feel, behave, even the way we automatically and effortlessly perceive one another. Responsible advertising and media professionals can do better. 
leveraging that same power that messaging has in instilling bias, developing stigmas, and deepening division. Good communications can revolutionize the way we come to understand and tackle problems. If what we're really after is to fully solve problems and alleviate suffering, public messaging should uplift, empower, and showcase a genuine understanding of the fully dimensional human experience. I often dig for a simple solution to ensure all the content we're exposed to is dignified, authentic, and reliable. But 4,000 advertising messages per day puts a responsibility on each of us to be more critical consumers of information. And although it often takes place subconsciously, for a message to effectively influence our perception requires the mind's permission. And so I'll leave you with one simple but essential first step. The next time you encounter emotionally triggering content, take a moment to dissect your emotions, assumptions, and thought process. If you catch the mind passing moral judgment, shift the focus away from the individual and instead be curious about the systems or the lack of support around them that might contribute to their circumstances. Our world's potential will be transformed if we habitually check our own mindsets and respond to the suffering around us with large-scale solutions that could render charity unnecessary. That's worth making temporary sacrifices to our own comfort and convenience in the pursuit of real progress. Thank you so much.